had built all the infrastructure, the roads, the bridges, the stores, the theater, even their homes are former plantation camps. A lot of the families had multiple people in their families that were working for the plantation. A lot of them didn't have vehicles. Some of them didn't even go to Hilo or Kona. They didn't need to. Their supervisors picked them up in the morning. They took them to work. If they had to go to the doctor, it was right here in Ka'u. So yes, indeed. Everything was provided by the sugar company. And just one day, the plantation was gone. They gave us the jobs and all of these benefits, and to have it just disappear, it was difficult, yeah. The idea of the plantation no longer being around was just a, an idea that the community was in shock about. A lot of change came with that. A lot of suffering and heartache and loss of jobs. My husband had worked for this company for about 30 years already, so he decided to grow coffee. Because both our families, my husband and mine, we grew coffee in South Kona. That's what built his confidence to grow coffee in Kau. And I, being a laboratory analyst in the mill, I knew that that exact spot would be perfect. That's why we chose Cloud Rest. get USDA grant that provide the seed money to start the Kau coffee farms and transition from that plantation system now to a more diverse and resilient model where the growers were in charge of their own futures. My great-grandfather John Searle, he was quite the fellow for 
working on all kinds of experiments, one of them being coffee. And coffee at that time was just grown in Kona, and he wanted to see if it would do good out in Kau. So he put in eight acres of coffee, and uh, it did very well. And there were quite a few newspaper articles written that his coffee was very, very good. After getting all of the documents from my mother, she was the holder of all the family history. So she passed that on to me. And uh, when I started reading a lot of it and finding how interesting it was and how he put together this eight acres of coffee, we just said, let's, let's try and, and uh, keep the legacy going. And uh, that's why we uh, started the, the coffee again. My dad was a chemist, my mom was a medical technologist. Uh, we were living in New Jersey where I, my brother and I had been born. And um, they came out specifically to Ka'u and to Pahala because my paternal grandparents lived here. And so my parents really wanted to retire here because they really liked the small town lifestyle. So they were here and kind of looking at a bunch of things and they went to visit Leonor Berte, who's uh, you know one of the original Ka'u farmers here. And so they were up at Cloudrest and hanging out on his farm and he's yammering on about trees and soil and all of this stuff. And my parents, they just looked at each other and without saying a word, they locked eyes and they knew that this is what they were gonna do. They were going to grow Ka'u coffee. And so when they came back to New Jersey and told my brother and I this, we thought they'd just completely lost their minds. Because remember, I just said, my dad was a chemist. My mom was a medical technologist. We lived in suburban New Jersey. That was all we knew. And um, for them to say that, okay, we're just gonna sell everything and we're gonna move to this tiny little town in Hawaii where you know my paternal grandparents live and start a coffee farm when they had no agricultural experience on a professional level whatsoever. Yeah, that was just wild to us. <laughs> we had no idea what was gonna happen. When we first acquired the land, we went out and we met with the growers to learn about what their challenges were. And there were some very concrete things that were lacking to be able to have a vibrant coffee community. A lot of those coffee farmers um, struggled um, to sell their coffee. A lot of them would harvest them and keep them in their homes under furniture. Um, not having the market or the niche for co coffee and the specialty of it. One of our uh, landlords, he owned the land at the time, used to come and talk stories with me in my little garden. And he would ask me what I thought the Ka'u coffee growers or the farmers needed to help boost our efforts because a lot of farmers couldn't sell their coffee. And I told him, you come from the mainland, New York, you can take the coffee there and let people try it. I'm sure they're gonna like it. If you do that, you'll be helping us. And he did. To build the, the market, we sourced 15 samples from various growers with no preparation, entered it in the 2007 SCAA Coffee of the Year competition, and won sixth and ninth that first year. Chris was savvy when he came in. He tasted that coffee. He was a coffee connoisseur. So he's like, this coffee is very special. We need to get it notarized in the worldwide competitions. And so I remember the first competition that, uh, that Chris took, the coffee farmer's samples there, and he called me and he said, we got number six and nine, the worldwide competition. I thought he said, we got 69, and I was stoked. I was so happy. I was like, number 69 in the world? Come to find out was number six and number nine. 
it was unbelievable for me because we're here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, a little island, and we could do that to represent our islands, to represent the United States. It just, it just blew me. front page news in Honolulu and obviously in Kau was big news in Hawaii and the specialty coffee scene. Um, there was a, a resurgence of community pride and a lot of those growers went back to those abandoned plots and started to uh, clear them out and, and grow them again. Um, so then we hired some consultants after that first success and taught the growers how to cup the coffee. Uh, what some of the best farming practices were, how to pick up defects in the coffee, how to better store the coffee so we had a higher volume of uh, more consistent quality so we could start to uh, attract uh, buyers. brought notoriety to not only the island, but also worldwide. And we had competitions thereafter. And then the growers kept entering that competition for five years. And ultimately were named Coffee of the Year five times. quite surprised to find that these coffees were coming out of Kau were scoring very high, um, high enough that it was um, outscoring even Kona, which um, has been a, a world-renowned coffee. So these coffee farmers had a hard time processing their, their coffee cherry or their, their parchment into green bean. And that is when Mr. Olson of the Edmund C. Olson Trust came up with the idea of starting a mill in the district of Kau on some of the lands that he owns up on Wood Valley Road. In 2010, uh, we broke ground for the Kau Coffee Mill. Hey, Aloha. The primary focus of the mill was to provide services to the existing coffee farmers. These farmers were on private lands of their own, not on Olson Trust land. But Mr. Olson wanted to provide a venue for them to bring their coffee cherry, either for sale, or to bring their parchment for hulling and grading. So the mill was a service to them to provide a, another source of um, bringing their, their coffee to uh, retail sale. And it, to this day, uh, many of the farmers who started with us back in the early 2011s um, are still bringing their coffee to us for hulling and grading and milling and roasting and packaging into their own private labels.
So the Kai'u Coffee Festival started in 2009 and has since grown to a 10-day event. It was designed to promote Kai'u as a premium coffee growing origin and a unique visitor destination. And it gives visitors an opportunity to see the farms, meet the farmers, taste the coffee, learn about our local culture. It's a 10 day event that includes music, hula, local artisans. We have farm tours. We have coffee tasting, brewing demonstrations. There's a tour to take folks to uh, a local ranch to see how cattle is raised and visit the coffee plantation. And we even have stargazing. So we're very proud of that. Kau is now at this point in time, after we've built up our name and we've gone to these other places in the world and we've made so many connections around the world in the specialty coffee industry, this is actually a point where we're really well positioned to get the information that we need, the technology that we need, the innovations that we need to uh, keep Kau on the map and have it grow as an origin that's really known for specialty coffee. And especially the younger generations that are coming in now, the connections that they inherently have because they came into Kau from the specialty coffee world and have that mindset of wanting to grow it in that direction. Um, you know, this is, this is, I'd like to say we've never been better positioned in the entire history of Kau coffee to meet future challenges than we are today. I'm happy because finally my family can come and grow the coffee, continue to do our dream, and to live the legacy that both my husband and I started. I guess I want to be remembered that um, we worked hard to keep the family estate going and uh, to continue the legacy of J.C. Searle. I'm hoping that uh, the future generation will um, see the importance of continuing on. like to see for the future of Kau Coffee is that those coffee farmers that started some 20 years ago, that they teach their children, they teach their grandchildren, that they are interested in agriculture, they are interested in staying here at home and continuing the coffee industry here in Kau. It's a very special one. It's a lot of work and it's a hard job. Um, we all know that. but. When the family's involved, there's a special connection there with the land. And now that they're owners, I can see that happening. <laughs>